time I could make time My name's Brad Breakright, and I'll be moderating this session today. Um, just a quick note, if there's any technical issues, please let me know in the chat and I will try and help solve them uh, for you. Um, I'd like to introduce Patty and Suzanne, who will be giving us a, a quick flyover of online learning and tips and tricks that will work. Um, Patty, I wonder if you could maybe link that song one more time in the chat, just for people that may have come in a bit earlier or a bit later. Um, so they can have a link to it as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. So with that, uh, Patty, Suzanne, it's all yours. Great. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and welcoming everybody. And I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are presenting to you today from the territories of the Wasanich peoples on whose traditional lands we are fortunate and grateful to live, teach, learn, and play. I'm going to give a quick introduction. Patty, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, my name is Patty Columbia, and uh, Suzanne and I are co hosting, obviously, this session. And we thought by introduction, we just give a little place on the map of where we have taught in our teaching careers. I'm pink, Suzanne's purple. And uh, so it's been, a, it's been a long trail across Canada for both of us. Um, I've been with SIDE, South Island Distance Education School in beautiful Victoria for the last 10 years. And that was um, my first step into distributed learning. Before that, I was in a brick and mortar school um, all over the place. Uh, Suzanne? Yeah, I'm from all, all over the map, as you can see. I was uh, born in Quebec, raised in Cape Breton, did some uh, schooling in Halifax, and I did some uh, teaching there at the post-secondary level. And then I also did my own education in Toronto and in London, Ontario. I uh, just received my doctorate in education a few months ago, and I am now living and teaching in British Columbia and um, at Sides with Patty. Yeah, I want to it's okay. been awesome having Suzanne on our team for sure. Um, uh, new to sides, but comes with just a wealth of knowledge. Um, a couple of things, we are going to be monitoring the chat box as we move along. So if you have questions that uh, come up, just fire them into the chat box. Suzanne and I are going to try to get to them. As Brad said, we've got just a short chunk of time. So we're hopefully uh, going to get um, to your questions, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, it, Brad always already covered if you're having tech issues and also letting you know that we will have the both the PowerPoint and some other uh, goodies uh, available on our website after the presentation is done. And just um, before you go, I did link the music, but you have you should know that uh, the singer and songwriter is also our grade eight teacher. And so it's just awesome because I can say to my grade eights, your teacher's a rock star and he really is a rock star. <laughs> I think all teachers are rock stars, Patty. I actually think it's an incredibly noble profession and I'm so glad everyone's here today. Before we go on, go ahead and take a minute and write in the chat box, either where you're from or maybe where you went to school or maybe, maybe where you've taught because uh, both Patty and I believe that uh, all these experiences help shape who we are. So go ahead and write, uh, write in the chat box. And I'm gonna go ahead and advance to the next slide while you're doing that. So while you're writing, you can just see here a quick overview of what we plan to cover today. Uh, just to give some context, we're gonna be talking about uh, our experience through the lens of, as teachers at SIDES. And we recognize that your context uh, might be different. And we, we strongly encourage uh, dialogue and, and questions as we go along. And again, recognizing we have one lens at SIDES and yours might be, uh, might be a little bit different. Patty, are you getting any cool juicy places? I don't have the chat open because I'm- Yeah, the, the chat's and... exploding with places all over. Uh, all over. Nice. I've seen so much of, of Vancouver, BC area, um, mm -hmm. lots of DL schools too. And so we, Suzanne and I both understand we're um, presenting to a seasoned DL crew and um, or online teacher crew. And, uh, you know, I just think of the Richard Bitgood session that I attended yesterday and he had a beautiful introduction where he, he um, um, said it's just 
the little small changes that you can make in your career are the meaningful ones. So hopefully in today's uh, presentation, all of you from all over the place, some on island, uh, some on the mainland, many on the mainland, uh, some not even in our province, um, I hope that you can take some of those changes that are just going to make the small differences and, and tweak what is already an amazing practice. And, and hopefully at the end of this session, add, uh, add your tips and tricks if we pace our timing uh, appropriately. Uh, I think it's important to begin with just a, a history of, of DL or distributed learning. I'm just going to abbreviate it from now on in British Columbia, because there was this perception that all of a sudden in 2020, when everyone went remote, that it was this learned thing. And in fact, British Columbia has a 100, actually 102 year history of, of doing DL. And that's important because it's always been done purposefully. You can look back and 100 years ago, uh, the government was sending out uh, quality curated materials to kids of lighthouse keepers. And obviously that technology changed over time. Um, you know, in the 50s, they started using radios and then maybe television and telephones. But again, the, the technology has changed hugely. But the important thing to remember is that, that it was always done purposefully and by people who had experience. And it's a very different story when we think about the emergency remote learning in 2020. And as we know, teachers in British Columbia and around the world, in fact, were really thrown to the lions when they were asked to start delivering their, their, their teaching online. And in many ways, it wasn't fair. I mean, it was just the way it was, but teachers hadn't received uh, appropriate training. There was a lack of material. So the narrative out there is very unfortunate, but the, the general public seems to think, well, distance education is terrible or online learning is awful. So we have a not the greatest reputation, but again, that's comparing two totally different things. So it's really important for us as DL teachers to, to recognize that our programs are built from the ground up. And that is what SIDES is, for example. SIDES has been around for more than 30 years, delivering really excellent um, programming that's designed with a, with a purpose. So again, it's important for us as, as DL teachers to differentiate and then to, to take that narrative elsewhere, that it's not a disaster to have online learning. In fact, we know there are many successful models and examples. Patty, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we had uh, this slide was um, called best practices, but after George's uh, very dynamic and exciting uh, presentation yesterday, I thought we need to use a little bit of this language and uh, it's counting on, I added counting on change. And I think as distributed learning or online teachers, that's really the, the one thing we for sure is that we know there's going to be change. That's our only constant. And whether that's ministry changes or curriculum changes or platform changes or whatever the changes are, um, we gotta be up and ready for it. So why pictures of me skiing? Well, going back to really what we ask our students to do, I think we need to do ourselves. And that's be able to take small chunks. Um, when I first learned how to ski, I was from, uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, never been on a set of skis of my life. Went skiing with my then boyfriend, now husband, and he was a hotshot skier. So he took me to the top of Sunshine Mountain. There was uh, two black diamonds on the sign. I had no idea what that meant. And you can imagine the disaster. And I think that trip, I actually became a worse skier rather than a better. And it's just because I was way out of my zone. Um, we decided probably it's better that I got took some lessons instead of have my boyfriend teach me. Uh, I went ahead and took some lessons. They just started with those small chunks and we built on from there. Now I have no problem keeping up with my son, keeping up with my husband. So we have to remember that as well with our online um, teaching is, um, you know, just staying within our zone, our comfort zone, but also pushing the edges and finding that fine balance every day with every new curveball that's thrown at us. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and so again, I was uh, changed the the title from this slide from a success stories to pushing the teaching platform. Uh, another great language that I, I got from uh, both Jen, Jen's recent session and uh, the session yesterday. Um, so there's been a number of success stories at sides where we've really pushed that teaching platform. So the first one, just to go over, is I have a teacher librarian position as well as an integration support teacher position. And the teacher librarian position, um, I, it's with a K to eight capacity. So I work evening shift at sides. I've done that for about four years. So parents can book intake meetings with me after their work schedule. And one day I was sitting there at 7 p.m. at night thinking, I wonder what my students are doing. I hope they're reading books in bed. And it dawned on me, 
why am I not reading them a book? And so I started what's called PJ and Story Time. So I zoom in um, at 7 p.m. on Tuesday nights, and the students join me. And they're in their pajamas, they're in their bed, they have a stuffy, they brush their teeth, they floss their teeth. It's time for stories. Um, so that's how it started. I had a few six people, or short, uh, a little handful of people, maybe six, eight kids would show up. But over the years, it built capacity. And as probably many online schools experienced slides absolutely exploded with attendance in September. So also my PJ story time was like a mini assembly. There was like screens of kids and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I'm really looking all the time. How can I take that same activity but push the teaching platform? So I started getting in guest speakers. So I had the vice principal read and the principal read a story. Um, I've just started a sort of buddy reading system where I got a grade 12 student that comes in, she zooms in now, and she's going to read to the young kids. And um, the reason the picture of the elderly woman is um, COVID has brought so much to us. <laughs> and I've really um, been mindful of the elderly and how they've been sort of locked up. And I, I um, thought, how can we, how can we as a community um, connect with our elderly people at this time. So right now I'm working with an assisted living home to get some of their residents read to our young children on Zoom. And, you know, if COVID hadn't been around, I can tell you right now those uh, that those people would not be familiar with the Zoom platform. They all are now. And so, uh, you know, just moving forward and pushing our teaching platform. I would say the same with um, some other activities we have. Smack, Yak, and Track is for the grades four to eight. And that's where I bring in authors. It used to be very difficult because authors didn't Zoom. Or, you know, if they did, some might, some might not. This year, they're just like, eh, yeah, absolutely. So I brought in authors from northern um, Saskatchewan, Laurent, Saskatchewan, an author in her tiny home with her sled dog team. She was right out there with her dog team while she talked to the kids. I brought in a graphic artist from Canmore. I brought in author from Ontario, a local author, authors from Nanaimo. And it's really um, connected with those older students, the grade four to eight students on the importance of writing. And maybe they're starting to see themselves as writers too. And just one more bullet, Suzanne, before I turn it over to you with my integration support uh, teacher hat on, we have um, uh, many, we have a very robust uh, learning service department at SIDES and uh, the students that come to us for SIDES are, um, our learning service students are often very, very damaged. They, um, they've gone through some really hard times. We have a very, very high disproportionate students coming to us with anxiety disorders and when they have those anxiety disorders it's it's very severe and so we really look at how can our sessions at sides how can we use the online platform to bring these students out of their dark place and back into our world and as a quick example i had a student that came to us five years ago and when she first came she was locked in a room she had locked the world out and um, we started just with them putting uh, her workers putting the ipad in front of her locked door and for five minutes I just sort of do a yammer on monologue. Um, eventually the iPad got in the room, eventually we were extending the time and then one glorious day she wrote back to me as I was talking and she wrote in all caps you talk too loud <laughs> and I was just like oh success I reached her. Uh, but you know flash ahead now that was seven years ago and she just sent me a photo um, yesterday with her holding her um, university student card she went she's finished college she went in full scholarships and she's now embarking university so this can be a platform that can really help some people that are in a difficult time I love that story Patty and it's it just reinforces we never underestimate the power of what we can do as DL teachers and I like how you've you've illustrated how the technology it's changing so quickly and and even authors becoming more comfortable with zoom and that's uh, led to some really cool field trips and that's something that we at sides are always keeping our eyes open uh, and some of the virtual field trips are pretty darn amazing these days so um, do use them do check them out um, at sides we do weekly weekly teacher-led zoom sessions and again those can be they're they're designed by the teachers so there's a great amount of difference but they're always um, really a highlight for both the teachers and the students um, we also use different technology to do school-wide community building. So, for example, during um, Carnaval, the French teacher designed a, a Padlet where kids could take pictures of their ice sculptures and post them. So, again, just using these um, these technologies as ways to um, uh, to engage kids and to uh, build school spirit. 
Um, before we get into some of the really practical um, uh, tips and tricks, I think it's really important to kind of look at some of the principles. And of course, there are basic principles and practices that we have to follow. And, and this applies whether we're in a classroom or whether we are teaching remotely. And I, I came up with what I call the five E's. And I'm actually going to go through the five E's of online teaching. Uh, and I'm going to go through each of these because I think um, I think they're they're quite important. They're all um, they're separate, but they're all linked in in some ways. And if we keep these in mind, uh, no matter what tools we use, no matter what approach we use, there's a lot of relevance. If we think about excellent excellence. I mentioned earlier, online learning has a mixed reputation, and and I believe fully that DL schools have to be places of excellence and not of mediocrity. And I think that all of us who are in DL, we have to embrace that and uh, infuse that into our, our practice. And if we look at what we do at SIDES, for example, uh, the SIDES program is very purposeful, as I said before, built from the ground up, highly organized, very well planned, uh, very responsive to not only changes in the curriculum, um, but changes in the way that students are learning. So when teachers see, for example, that students are responding to a particular uh, lesson or a particular unit or uh, particular ways of learning, we can make those changes quickly. And those are all the things that they're good classroom practice and they're good online practice. So again, I just wanna um, encourage all of us as DL thinkers to believe in the excellence and the importance of what you're doing and infuse it into everything you do, because if you don't, you're not gonna be going in the right uh, direction. Expectations are hugely important, of course, in the classroom, but we need to consider our online context. And there may be different expectations that we have as educators, and there may be different expectations uh, from, from, from everybody. So really look and examine what your goals and your purpose are of the course you're teaching or of the, the people to whom you're teaching it and consider all of the stakeholders. Um, of course, there's administrators, there's your colleagues, uh, there's the students and, and, and parents as well in the case of DL. And I think we recognize that parents uh, can potentially play a much larger role in their students' education uh, when we're engaging in DL. Um, as a rule, it's important to establish routines, but also to be flexible. And obviously we do that in a classroom, but I think there has to be an extra level of flexibility with DL teaching um, because stuff changes so quickly and we don't always have that, well, we don't really have that face-to-face -face connection. So again, have those routines uh, but do be flexible. I think one of the very important things we have to consider is equity. And we've all heard about the digital divide. Uh, there are issues, of course, of affordability, availability, and adoption when it comes to technology. And we all know that not all students have the same access to devices or bandwidth we heard earlier um, in, in the keynote, uh, or, or even workspaces at home. Um, we have different levels of privacy that students um, have at home. and. Uh, DL, successful DL teaching and learning really requires strong family support. And that's not always equal among our students. So there's all these factors that we need to think about that, that could create inequities, but we also need to remember that yes, there's a potential for the digital divide, but DL can also be an amazing tool to improve equity and accessibility. So do infuse that into your uh, practice and think about how you can use it to improve equity. Engagement, we've heard a lot about this and uh, we know that kids are on screens more than ever. So uh, how do you actually engage them? We've seen lots of great um, workshops so far from, from lots of really smart people who have tons of experience and we've heard about the importance of uh, variety and choice in activities. We know it's important to provide student-centered activities like games or quizzes or incentives like digital badges. And those all have a really important place in, in our practice as DL educators. Um, it's really, really important also, though, to remember about social emotional support. And uh, there's still a huge social emotional element to, to learning. And when we think about all the amazing tools we have, whether it's Kahoot or all these, these gadgets, those are good. There's nothing wrong with those. But do remember that one of the most important factors in student outcomes is whether the student thinks the teacher cares. And that applies in the classroom and online. And I would argue we even have a more important role as as DL teachers to play to make sure students uh, know that, that we care about them. And that relates very directly to my last E, which is empathy. We don't know what our students' contexts are. Uh, we don't know what their family circumstances are. And, and, and probably that's more so more true in the case of, of DL educators. We can't, we don't have chats with them every day. So, uh, and telling what those emotions might be from afar, it's really, really hard. So we have to consider what they're going through. I mean, empathy plays a huge role in, in, in our work as teachers, but I think even more so as, as DL. And so when in doubt, err on the side of empathy. 
on that note, I'm going to hand it over to you, Patty, to get going on some of your tips and tricks. I'm mindful of the time here. We need to keep marching along here. It's almost 10 to go ahead, Patty. Yes, this time goes by quickly. So uh, tips and tricks. So um, there's many things the engagement, as Suzanne has said, has been uh, uh, something that's been brought up many times in the different sessions today. It's always on the forefront of our mind. There's many things that we all use. I don't think anything I use here is going to be a groundbreaker for you, but maybe there's some things that uh, have a different edge that you might be able to work with. Um, the visual I have up is our library homepage. So it, it really addresses to the last two bullets. Um, the My fellow librarian, Holly Bear, and I like to call it the one-stop shop. We want people to be able to come to one place and get all the information they need. So if a student needs to do research, they can go ahead and do their research. If they're stuck on their research and they need to ask a librarian a question, they can do that. Uh, if they want to sign up for our events, they just click on the sign up page. Uh, what's going on this month, the newsletter, there's our distributed or our um, at a distance book sign out system. So we have that one stop shop and this is something that um, was was uh, emphasized in many of the sessions I attended yesterday is that presence and, and always sort of knowing that presence. Our, our design uh, person at sides is incredible. He's made this uh, uh, our little librarian there and she appears all over the place and students know are associating that logo or that icon with, with the library itself. So having that, um, that ability to quickly find what they need is really important. Um, also, I'll just take a minute to speak to time frame. Uh, I remember back when I was teaching in northern Saskatchewan, we noticed that in the second recess, uh, the 20 minute long afternoon recess, the last five minutes were horrible. Things were all falling apart. You know, people were fighting, people were crying and we're like, what is going on? And we're trying to figure out how do we solve this problem? And uh, one brilliant teacher said, why don't we just shorten the recess? And uh, we did, we shortened the recess, we let them go five minutes earlier at the end of the day, problem solved. Same thing with distributed learning, online learning for sure. And uh, as an example in my pajama story time, at one point I realized it was just too long and the chat box was exploding with stuff that had nothing to do with the book I was reading. And I was just like, this is raveling out of control. So what I did is I just tightened it up. I added music, I added a little motion break and boom, we are back on track. So always being uh, mindful of those things, are, are those types of things are going to really help engage your students. And we can just move on to the next slide. Okay, soon. sounds good. Let's see here. There we go. Some of your more tips and tricks. Yeah, yeah. and uh, oh my goodness, I just love Jen's uh, session this morning. Every time she was uh, saying something, I was like, yes, oh, perfect. And and uh, I was so glad that she she encouraged us to get creative. Uh, my visuals here are of doc cameras and I re rely on a doc camera a lot um, both with my integration support students when I'm meeting them but also for the library um, so when COVID happened our staff exploded not just our student population exploded so did our staff and also our two doc cams were in high use and it was hard for me to find one so I thought what to do what to do so um, our tech people had a whole basket full of webcams. So I took this contraption at the bottom and uh, it's a, uh, uh my husband used to make me beer. This is what he bottled the, the bottles with. And I attached the webcam with a bright red twist tie. And what I loved about this is I could move it up and down. So you can see I'm doing a lesson here on money math with this student. I got the camera down low so she can see the dime versus the nickels. And when I'm using it for story time, I just sort of move the arm up and uh, we're able to see the whole book. Um, just find, find something that works, get creative. Um, some other things that I use that, that have worked really well for me is music. Uh, again, looking at the different age groups that I work with when I was working with, uh, when I'm doing the pajama and story time, I have no problem engaging the students. Oh my goodness, it's like getting everyone to turn off their mics so I can read the book is the problem. They're telling me everything, the dog that, you know, they just took for a walk, they lost a tooth, their sister hit them, their sister loves them, you know, everything's coming out on the table, they love to chat. And so I've actually got, been going on to my story time earlier and earlier to give them this chat platform. Um, move ahead to my grade four to eight and uh, I get on 10 minutes early and they get on and it's like, 
I'm like, hello, is everyone, is everyone's mic working? And I get someone type yes into the chat box. And I'm like, okay, this is awkwardly quiet. So what I do is I use music to help me with both of those problems. Uh, for my older students, I have music at the beginning. It's just a nice um, introduction to the, uh, to the uh, event. I'll try to play something like their grade eight teacher's rock star music or something that they can resonate to. And with my little guys, I play music at the end. And I always tell them, oh, Boys and girls, I can hear the music. That means that we're going to be wrapping it up for tonight. And so they know that almost, um, I'm showing my age, but when I used to uh, hear the Mr. Dress Up music start, <laughs> I used to know the show was over. And so I'm using that kind of concept with music. So I guess my point with my tips and tricks is just to get really, really creative with it. And the other thing I would just, um, want to quickly address is the green screen. So I have many different green screens and instead of using the green screens just as beautiful tools, I use the green screens as a teaching tool as well. So one of the things I wanted to have is my students not just read on Tuesday nights when I'm there, I want them to read every day, all day. I want them to read books. So I had a contest where every week they can send me a picture of them reading a book in an unusual place. And then I post the picture up on the green screen. They love it. And I get pictures of them. I built a couch for it in the living room. This is my bed. I'm reading in my bed. I get pictures galore. So I put the picture up here. It's part of the lesson. Uh, whenever we're, we're reading a new book, I will um, put up the title of the book or the front picture of the book and we use visual clues. We're, we're working very hard with the little guys on using pictures to learn what the story is about. So I'll say to them, boys and girls, this is today's story. What do you think it's going to be about? And they start putting their guesses in. So, you know, just as a green screen itself, it can be an amazing teaching tool. Um, by the way, I got that uh, idea of taking a picture and you of you reading a book from uh, the Rick Mercer show. So, I mean, these ideas are not original, but just looking at your world and seeing how they can, you can pull them in to make the green screen um, a really in interactive thing. Um, and what happens when you don't have a green screen? They're expensive. We have one in our school. So how do you do that? Again, I go back to Jen Griffin's presentation. I loved it. And uh, let's get creative. So I just bought a blue painting sheet at the dollar store. I hang it up on my Murphy bed, again, with twist ties. I love twist ties. <laughs> and uh, now nobody has to see my messy study. Plus, I, I've got a green screen instead, or in this case, a blue screen. Uh, coupled with that, I've got a really cool teaching tool that I can use. And a very major MacGyver there. I mean, really, it is so cool that you don't need an expensive, uh, you know, whether it's your camera, you're adjusting or your green screen. Great. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Fatty, ready for me to take over with the yeah, next slide? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I thought that's super. So it's always hard to follow on your, on your, <clears throat> right after you. But I thought maybe we, I'd go ahead and just show you uh, kind of some of the, the tips and tricks that I use. Uh, we have a, a one hour uh, B class, virtual class every week at Sides. And that's pretty much what most of the elementary teachers do. Um, so I thought I'd go ahead and show you what we might do in a typical class. I'm going to go ahead and uh, link here. We I start, uh, this is an agenda from a couple of months ago. I always like to show pictures. I'm a visual kind of person. So I go through, uh, show them a picture. We always start with a little warm up to get the kids engaged. I, I have this, I found this website called Would You Rather. So in this case, would you rather it be warm and rainy or cold and snowy? And and the kids write in the chat box. And I always say to them, you can't just give an answer. You have to justify it. So I'll show you this um, website. It's kind of a neat one. And just so everyone knows, we will we have a we're going to supply a PDF of the slideshow with uh, all the hyperlinks will work. So if you're interested in using any of these resources, don't worry about trying to write them down now. You can um, access them later. So again, this this is a website that has a whole list of all kinds of uh, would you rather the kids absolutely love it and again it engages them it gets them uh, comfortable using the chat box in an appropriate and respectful way then i go ahead and do boring things like attendance one day this our principal and vice principal attended um, so this is kind of the kids know what to expect through through the class so there's the would you rather i also have a, a came across a, a really neat scavenger hunt and again the kids love this there's a whole list of things that they can you just turn it on. We use music, go, go um, run around the house and find an object. So it might be something like um, your favorite toy. And then the kids come back and it's basically like a virtual show and share. 
um, might be something like uh, something that smells amazing. So again, all kinds of things, something makes a beautiful sound and you give them a minute, you get the timer going. There's nothing like a timer to get kids uh, up and running. And that also breaks up the monotony of them sitting in a chair or lying on a bed for the whole thing. So again, just a little tool that we use. Um, I used that particular agenda because I had a student, um, a black Canadian student who approached me and said, can I do a presentation for Black History Month in our V class? And she had approached me and I thought, oh my goodness, what a way to have the best kind of authentic learning. She did this amazing presentation, this incredible slideshow. And that's why our principal and vice principal came that day. And I thought there was nothing that I could ever have done as a teacher to, um, to teach something like that, that than she did. It was the most authentic thing I've seen. And it's just one of those things where I hadn't planned uh, to have student presentations per se, but she approached me. So again, that's that whole thing about, yes, set expectations, but be flexible, because sometimes that's when the best learning happens, both in the classroom and virtually. It was just a, an amazing presentation. Um, I also encourage the kids to do art presentations, because again, it's really hard to build community and engage kids. And if they're showing something that they've done in art and talking about it, they're developing all kinds of skills. They're, they're feeling engaged, first of all, they're connecting with their peers and they're developing oral skills that uh, we know happen in the classroom, but it's also really crucial to get those online. One of the things I use regularly is good old Flippity. And for those of you who aren't familiar, Flippity has all kinds of cool things it does and the kids go nuts over this. So let's say I need to choose somebody to, uh, to go first with a presentation. We've got, I call this the rainbow spinner. This is for my class. You enter the names in a spreadsheet and the names come up and they're just on the edge of their seats. And it's really cool. If you want to put them into groups, there's all kinds. You just click on this and then you can also talk to them about uh, random. Uh, so there's all kinds of even lessons that you can bring out of this a seating chart. Of course, that's not relevant in our case, but if you want to put them in teams. Uh, so it's just a really uh, great resource that the kids love. Uh, one of the things I actually ended up doing is I ended up placing my students in what we call house groups. So I used to teach at an independent school and there were four different houses, kind of like Harry Potter. And it really created a sense of community and friendly competition. And, and again, the kids love it. So we did that in my class. And now we play Jeopardy and the kids are divided into their house groups. Um, we recently did a, an Orca inquiry. And again, the kids were divided into their house groups. And it's just a way to uh, engage them and to get them to feel like they're part of a team. So we do have a whole uh, Jeopardy. Actually, and you can do this, I think, in Flippity as well. You can generate some questions, but it's kind of cool. Uh, it's 12.02. I want to go super, super quickly here. Um, the kids, again, they get into the groups. And lo and behold, these are all, you know, with the exception of entertainment, these, you know, Canadian Charter Rights and Freedoms, Human Body, these are all directly related to our curriculum. So, again, there's lots of ways that you can engage them and still be teaching the curriculum. And, of course, one of my favorites here is New York Times what's going on in this picture. And this is great, not only for uh, grade five, but really all the way up to grade 12. Um, it encourages lots of um, thinking and visual thinking, making lots of connections. So that's a tool I would definitely suggest using. So again, all these links will be available. Um, I think is we that, want to, yeah, There is ahead. a question in the chat box um, oh, asking is. the platform for the scavenger hunt. What was that made in? Do you know what that was, I believe, well, let's go back and take a look as far as I that was shared by a colleague, which leads me to, to point out it is so important for us to this was simply just on. Uh, I think it's just Google Slides. Yeah, it looks like Google, yeah, Google Slides. Sure. And this was shared by by a colleague. And, uh, and that's something we should all remember. There's so much we can gain by looking at what our colleagues are doing. There's lots of great sharing going on at sides, for example. And even in the keynote this morning, they talked about the importance of this being an ongoing learning community. So it's 12.03. I don't want us to run out of time because um, Patty and I really wanted to, to talk about success stories, not just ours, because we've been telling you about our success stories, but we want to know what your success stories are and what is your favorite tip or trick to share. And just to true, true confession, I've not been monitoring the chat box because I'm screen sharing and I'm not sure if, if I monitor the chat, then will that show up? I'm not sure from a technical point of view whether that shows up on everybody's screen, but um, I have been monitoring Susanna and, great. and okay. we're looking good. I think we've, okay. we're answering the questions that are coming up for sure. Um, okay. We got some Mr. Dress Up fans out there and uh, lots <laughs> yeah, of old teachers like know. you and me, right? We know, yeah, kids of the 70s. But, oh boy, um, maybe I'm super dating myself. No, I'm there too. Um, yeah, so favorite tips or tricks, because I know um, that's how that's how we all do our best learning when we're when we're sharing what our experiences have been. So we do have a few minutes. We have gosh, more than 10 minutes left to go. So um, if anyone wants to share either um, orally or in the chat box, I know that many of you have lots of great things to contribute. 
And maybe while we're just hearing some of those or, or getting some of those uh, ideas into the chat box, um, just it, it's just uh, really important to know um, that we're always driving this back to the student. And even though we're online learners and we're using all this technology, it's all about the student. And um, when when I understand that the student has moved their learning or moved their social learning because of a online program, then I feel like I've been successful. And the other day I learned that one of my frequent flyers from story time was actually running her own story time. And I was like, what? That's awesome. <laughs> so this small little grade two girl has a following apparently, and um, she's running her own story time. She reads them a book, just like Mrs. Columbia reads them on Tuesday. So that to me is like, okay, it's moved to the next level. I'm happy. Now, Al has added uh, with young kids, I do stuffy Zoom sessions where everyone has a stuffy and takes on a persona, which is great. And uh, we have a, we have stuffies at story time. I have a rabbit. I should have brought him. He's uh, in, in the closet right now, <laughs> literally. And um, so, <laughs> so that's a great thing to do. The kids love the stuffies for sure. Uh, Dawn is saying she has a mystery bag and that's been a really great hit with the K to one. So they take turns sharing their own mystery bag. So it's not just always teacher led. Uh, this is a student's chance for sharing and it's sort of a, a ver version on show and tell, which is great. Um, Maggie is sharing that she does a connect and share uh, with Flipgrid. And so the students like it. And um, that sounds, Maggie, that sounds like a really great thing to do. And, and maybe you could even um, share the link for Flipgrid. That'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, we're always looking for different resources and just Back to that, I think as teacher librarian, I have a trump card because I'm able to, uh, te uh, teachers are often asking me to come as a guest into their class. And I feel like I get so many ideas by going into other teachers' classes. So um, yeah, the more we can do to share what we're doing in our classroom, the um, teaching can sometimes be a little bit isolating. You're in your own room. Um, but the more we can share and collaborate, not just at wonderful conferences like this, but uh, every day in our classroom, the better. Yeah, and on that note, just um, we, we're gonna uh, come up with a slide with the list of our takeaways and that there we, we will have a document with links to all of the resources that we use and uh, by all means share in the chat box and then we can uh, put those suggestions in as well mm -hmm. for anybody. Any more success stories coming up there, Patty, in the, uh, in the chat box? I think that I've highlighted most of them. If anybody would okay. like to turn their mic on too, if you don't feel like typing and you wanna share with your mic, just go for it. Uh, Pinder, it, uh, our slides will be available on the website. Um, I, I think that's the best way to access them. And that, is that right, Brad? Everybody, everybody can, will still have access to the website, be able to download the materials yes. from there? Yeah, that's for sure. Perfect. Yeah, so I've got a PDF version of it. Uh, and again, those hyperlinks will all work. So if you want to take a look and see like New York Times or Flippity or any of those, I'm actually going to change the Flippity one to a generic one and not my class. But uh, yeah, all those links will work and that will be, we'll upload it right after, um, right after we're done here today. Uh, what about, um, for done sharing success stories, what about, what about questions from our audience because um, we've, I feel like we've gone through this a little bit quickly. We've been very mindful of the time, but are there any questions about any of the principles or the practices or, the, or Patty's tricks, how she can actually do that? We're more than happy to answer any questions. Most of my tricks too were just from bumping into walls and dark rooms. It's just like, uh, maybe I'll try this and, and uh, I could probably do a, another 45 minute presentation on the things that didn't work. <laughs> so um, we'll save that one for next year. Um, Elle has just added using the whiteboard to share drawings. So that the whiteboard is a powerful tool. I did have it listed on, um, on one of those things to engage. I really love the whiteboard. It can be a very interactive uh, interactive way of keeping the kids on track. Um, shared stories as well. That's another thing that Elle is doing. So each child adds word to a story and they build a silly story together, which sounds like a lot of fun. I love that. Because then again, that goes right back to not only are you building engagement and community, but you're actually, you know, you're fulfilling curriculum. And I think whenever we can do that as, as DL teachers, that's just, you're hitting all those points. It's not just, I mean, there's times when it's simply community building and maybe we're not dealing with curriculum and that's okay too. But uh, when you can get those all together, that's bonus, right? 
for sure. And I'll wait the 10 seconds of silence to ensure that there's no questions. <laughs> Everybody's tummy is growling. That's really what's going on, right? Because we, I don't know, we're used to having lunch a little bit earlier. Um, Brad is mentioning have... Pictionary on the whiteboard. So that's nice. another great idea for sure. Yeah, again, just going back to games. I know it's not, and it's not just at the elementary level. I think by nature, we as humans are, are competitive, you know, and when you, you know, you, you don't want it to be something where it gets out of control, but I've just seen with my own students where you have that friendly competition. Oh my goodness, it gets them going and it gets them excited about, about learning. So yeah, Pictionary, uh, Jeopardy, anything you can use. To, the Kahoot awesome. that was mentioned. Categories in French is another one that's just come up on the Jamboard. So nice. that sounds like an awesome idea yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and again, sometimes you have, you can, you can use those tips and tricks. And then maybe sometimes I kept thinking, oh, my kids are going to get sick of Jeopardy. And it turns out when I got them to do a little uh, reflection form, oh, we want more Jeopardy. So, and that's another thing, you know, that when we're in a classroom, we often do exit tickets. We often get feedback directly from kids and it's a little harder to do that in a DL context, but just do it. I do digital exit tickets. I, I get them to do a digital reflection. So tell us what's working, tell us what's not. And again, adjust. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier, Patty. It's just making it work for for your students so we do have patty um did a really awesome uh, pdf called uh 10 what is it how to make your zoom room boom and i think the title alone deserves an award but um patty is very well versed in in booms in, in boom in zoom so there's a, a bunch of zoom tricks we will have that is that on the site, site already patty yeah, it's or already up there super, it's already there and we'll make the slide deck available with embedded resources and then we also have a separate google doc with links um and you're more than welcome to let us know if we should add something. And by all means, email us. Um, email our contacts are on the front page and in the Google Doc. And uh, we're always happy to um, take your questions or suggestions. Thanks. And, and just um, in closing, I feel like Suzanne's right. The stomachs are rumbling. <laughs> um, but in closing, I think the takeaway that I have had from this experience of this past year, um, and it's it's been an a year like none other, like just when I thought things couldn't get crazier, they got crazier. Uh, my men kept saying, we're building the plane while it flies. And I really felt that way. It didn't feel like a very controlled year or that I had control of my, um, my situation as much as I usually do. But as online teachers, I think we are prone to change and, and we're, we're flexible. We get that. It's just the nature of how our classes work, work at the best of times. So building the plane while it flies probably would have been a really scary thing for me if I had stayed in the classroom uh, in Haida Gwaii. I, I probably would have been very frightened of it. But building the plane while it flies and, and getting these programs out there and touching kids and um, learning from mistakes and doing all those things that we as, as online teachers are doing all of the time, um, that's how we move forward. And that's how we um, become the better skier, become the better reader, <laughs> become the better teacher is um, by taking those small, scary tap steps and doing it. And it's what we tell our kids, right, Patty? I mean, we, I always say to my students, I, I, I want you to struggle. I don't want this to be easy peasy lemon squeezy because then you're, you're not learning. It's when we're struggling that we're doing our best learning. And I think we can say that as educators as well. There are, there will be struggles inevitably, whether it's with the technology or how are you engaging the students. But, um, but again, that's how we grow. And I think it's important to note before we go, I think DL is going to play a very important, it has played an important role for a hundred years, but in our post COVID uh, times, it's going to play an even more important role in the academic literature. There's a lot of discussions about, you know, it's here to stay. Um, and I think, uh, I think we should be proud as, as DL educators, what we've been able to do, even though the plane has been rumbling a little bit, I think we're, we're actually producing an amazing, I don't know if it's a supersonic jet that's already been done, but I think we've learned so much. And I think just go back to that idea of excellence. We, we have to be excellent as, as DL educators. There's, there's nothing sort of, um, you know, sloppy that we can do, but this, the stakes are too high because the, the kids who are learning remotely have have the, every right to a, an excellent education the same as, as they do in a neighborhood school or an independent school or wherever they're learning so that, there's a big responsibility for us but I think it's exciting times and and we're showing not only here at sides but all of you out there what can be done and what must be done to keep DL excellent so thank you I guess that's my cue to jump in um, Patty Susan thank you so much for your 
uh, expertise in this. I think I can say on behalf of Kenny, learn all the sponsors and probably everyone in this room. Uh, it's been a great session with lots of uh, good tips and tricks. And even if it's stuff that we know, just reminders about things that we can do differently or maybe add back into our classes if we've kind of dropped them for various reasons. So thank you so much. Thank you. Go grab lunch, everybody. Enjoy. Thanks so much for coming. Take care.